These are, are these albacores also? Those are albacores, yeah. Did you want these back? No. You sure? No, I think not. Okay, no, no. good. Because I, okay, that would be great. And the only other ones I have are rather sort of, uh, which I did, you know, sort of things like that oh, taken that? in there. Well, well, that's good too. If, if. And here are we, here are the uh, Avengers on the way to Palembang to bomb them. Uh -huh. I don't think you want that. That's my albacore in the desert. <laughs> oh, yes, of course I would. <laughs> and these are all really the pictures of our attack on Palembang and what we did to the refinery. Yeah, right. Uh, now, you, where exactly is Palembang? In uh, Sumatra. It is in Sumatra. It's on the, uh, it's on the, the, the north coast and we had to fly from the uh, south coast across Sumatra to get there. And here was a, I don't think this is one, here was an, when we were away, here was an attack on, attack on the fleet by, by some uh, Germans. No, that's, that's good, that's good, because I've got some, some pictures of, of some of that. another one being knocked down. Yeah, them. I had seen those, uh, you know, in there, and I thought those were, oh, this is, yeah. Yeah, Another one you can see actually the, the aircraft flying around and uh, now do you know what ship it is that's being attacked here? Or? Well, there, there, we had four aircraft carriers. Um, we were in the Victorious, and there was the illustrious Victorious, uh, Indomitable, and uh, Implacable, and then the uh, one that got bombed rather badly. I think the Indomitable and uh, the Formidable came in and took its place. So we had. We had four carriers. So these could be any of them. It could be any of them. Yeah. Uh, here's another one with the attack. And uh, there we are, another one. Another one. Now, were you on the ship at various times when when you this were under was happening? With it, when was well, when this was happening. Uh, I was off leading my group to Palembang. They came oh, in when the fleet was there waiting for us to come back. Oh. And, um, and uh, so that, and they shot them all down. I think they were, they were attacked by six uh, of, the, um, of the Japanese planes and they shot oh. them all down and we came back. The only time that we were seriously attacked, was, I think I had in here pictures of when we were hit by, uh, by the, the kamikaze. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, uh, right. The, these kamikazes, yes, uh, and we were hit. And, um, now, were you on board at that time? Oh, yeah. Oh, you were? Oh, yeah. And I was on board, and uh, quite truthfully, uh, when I, I was up there seeing some of our planes come in, and we came in safely, thank God. And, uh, and then, this is the 9th of May, then we were hit by two kamikazes. The first one hit up in the bow and bounced off and went into the sea. And uh, the second one came down on the rear, and I was standing with the uh, uh, with the flag, the uh, uh, landing guy, mm -hmm. and I saw this damn thing coming, so <laughs> I went down in, uh, and when I went down, I then, <laughs> on my left leg, I hit a scuttle, and it, it uh, fractured the bone in my uh, foot, and I've al always had that problem <laughs> ever since. Oh. <laughs> and uh, it, it then did, did not much damage, David, because as you probably know, what happened was that they, they hit, they, they hit uh, the formidable very badly, but only because it had planes on deck. And it, it, all of those caught fire and the rest of it. <coughs> another, uh, another carrier, I don't think it was the formidable, but one of the others, the plane, actually the chemicals exploded down in the forward hangar, which was down, uh, the lift down in the hangar, and of course that caused a lot of trouble. 
But we luckily had no planes on deck when they, they came in, and um, so that the damage was, was superficial. And then when we got to um, either Ulithi or Manus, uh, after those attacks, and what was happening to the American um, uh, carriers, they came to see us because they they suddenly realized that one thing that the English carriers had, the fleet carriers, they had an iron deck, uh, apart from the, the uh, stern and the bow, iron deck right the way through, and the whole of the, the um, uh, hangar space was completely encased in, uh, in metal. So when these kamikazes hit, they, they didn't penetrate the deck, whereas with the American carriers, which wooden decks, they went through and caused a hell of a lot of damage because they get through that first deck and then they would be explode and they would be in the hangar with planes and everything. So the, the Americans obviously uh, were very interested in this kind of um, construction. Now, of course, with that kind of construction, as they all knew, they would have to give up speed for safety. In other words, uh, our carriers with this, with this metal thing could only go probably 27 to 30 knots uh, flat out, whereas, of course, the American carriers were going at 35. So I think they had to weigh up that, but it was, it was a lot of interest in, in that particular case. Um, here, this one, you saw the pictures yes. of how they hit the Victoria. It did no damage at all. I mean, it, it was terrific. Um, so that was something that, uh, that uh, we had a great advantage. Yeah. I got these, uh, you had given me these two books, by the yeah. way, Lucas. Yeah. And uh, I know you've written, there's a chapter or two in that, to yeah. each one, but I yeah. think each of them that, that, uh, that you wrote yeah. about, I think okay. one was. One was about a friend of yours, I think, uh, yeah. and the other one was about okay. your, your reign. And I, I gave you one of those. No, I've never gotten one of those. Never got one of those. Yeah, you, I remember we had talked about it, and yeah. I think at the time you thought maybe they were out of print or something. Well, so I don't have are. one of those yet, but I would love to have one, and, and for the library too. If yeah. We could ever lay our hands I on one. I thought I'd given you one, and you gave it to the library. Right? No, yeah. no, it was, uh, the, you did give me an extra one of these, yeah. which I did give to the library. I can lend you that. I can't very well give it to you for the for the library. No, no, no. Well, I do you mind if I'd love to borrow well, read it, please take and it then back. I could I could take some stuff out of yeah, it too. Yeah, see, I'm down to this is I've got this and one more left, and I've been trying to get it. I haven't tried very seriously, but I, what I want to try and get it reprinted in this country. Mm -hmm. What happened? To give you an idea, what happened when uh, I was dealing with this? The uh, person who said he was a wonderful American ace, I, I questioned him. But anyway, he had a girlfriend, and uh, they managed to get me this publisher in uh, Taunton, or the, the west of England. And I would then send, she would say, right, they want another so many thousand uh, pounds, and so many, etc., to get the thing printed which was done, and it, 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 it was very successful in England. I went over there, and I went round and, and uh, you know, visited the main uh, bookstores in London and in the south of England, and signed copies and the rest of it, and it went very well. Luckily, luckily, uh, I sent copies to all the members of my squadron, uh, and we had a, also, uh, uh, a reception uh, the day of it in, in the Savoy and all the people that came in had copies. I was glad because then what happened? Uh, this woman died and then suddenly the, the publisher, not a big publisher but a thing she got, then uh, got permission to incinerate all the copies he had left, which was about 2,000, 
because she hadn't paid one of the checks that I sent. And not got through. Well, you know, it sounds stupid, but the point is, if 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 I had known more about the publisher, or if they'd known where I was, if they just said to me, "Listen, uh, so and so is not paid," I'd have paid. And made it, but they went bankrupt, not just because of the copy, but uh, so th that was a hell of a business. Now, luckily, Laddie Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> who now died unfortunately, but Addy Lucas, he suddenly found, they, they found some some barn that she had, a uh, garage or something like that, and there were lots of books, that, and he found about 50 of this book, which I had to buy, but that's fine, so I, I had those, so I've been living off that 50 mm -hmm. for about two or three years. Now, I I took the book, and I did the wrong thing. I took the book to Mark McCormick's <coughs> publisher, and Mark recommended that you know, I see them. And, uh, you know, they said what anybody would say, well, this should be published in England. Well, that's fine, but, you know, with the few copies that I was able to distribute, there are many people our age my age older than you, but our age who are interested in the war, very interested, probably more interested than, than the British. And you have a sale for, for books on, uh, particularly on the war and, and air and the rest of it. Especially now with Tom Brokaw's book and uh, some right. of the movies. It, it's right. very, uh, right. I'm going to take a look at my thing, I'm sure it's ready yeah. right here. And, um, you know, so I, I still am going to try and get um, that copy uh, uh, copied, and that's why I, I, you know, I can't give it to you. I'd like it. Oh no, no, <laughs> I can well understand. Yeah. yeah. Now the other thing about uh -huh. these, um, I, I looked in uh, some of these things that I had. Here were the war pictures, most of which not in the manuscript. Oh. And. Uh, uh, these are more personal than, than uh, really uh, yeah. all these are. Uh, but I think there are. Well, well, maybe I could borrow that and, and make copies like I did of your... Now, uh, there are a lot here about the, the Western Desert Yeah, fly. well, that's real interesting because you know, and, that's where uh, the Americans first started fighting. Yeah, I think of me. Yeah. And uh, then I take... <laughs> That was a very interesting one, Operation Chocolate. Uh, when, we were, when I was in 821, they chose the albacores that had long-range tanks. This is between three squadrons, 821, 826, two squadrons. And I was one of the ones that had, a, had a, an aircraft with long-range so what they did with this Operation Shocker, which was quite fun, we took off down from an airport near Cairo, and we flew 200 miles into the desert beyond the German lines. I was going to ask you about that, because yeah, you had mentioned that's right. that. And, <laughs> and uh, we had Bombay, these old big Bombay uh, transport uh, Oh, well, that's what I wanted to know, because yeah. you said, I, I didn't quite understand what Bombay referred yeah. to, so yeah, that was a big a aircraft, oh. uh, uh, sort of a transport uh, mm -hmm. uh, carrying air, and so uh -huh. they flew in oh, with I us, okay. uh, with um, uh, Marines to protect us if we were to, and then we stayed there until it was dark, and it was quite an interesting thing, because <laughs> we saw a lot of lights coming down from the from the coast, we were we were about a hundred miles in and two hundred, and you know we thought, God, we're going to be caught. But <laughs> so we took off at at, uh, at sort of uh, in the evening when the the, the plane, the uh, freighters were approaching Tobruk, right. which the Germans had, had won then, and we flew from there up, bombed the uh, the ships. And then flew into uh, our base in in uh, Western Desert. 
And it was a, a long flight for an albacore, but we were refueled by the Bombay's. And, um, but some of, the, some of the experience, some of the people ended up, you know, didn't have the right directions in God. That was quite an interesting right. one. Now the albacore, did it, was it also a torpedo plane? Yes, as well it was. As it that, was. that was how it was uh, designed. Right. And um, uh, there, were, there, was, there were quite a few occurrences when we were in the desert, uh, when we had to go after the Italian fleets, which uh, of course they were, Taranto was more swordfish. And the swordfish were the planes uh, that really uh, flew into Taranto and really immobilized the, the uh, Italian fleet. And then of course the Albacore came in after the swordfish, although that remained mainly the swordfish had a squadron in the desert that did anti-submarine, but, but not the bombing. And um, that is a much better picture of the planes going in Operation Chocolate. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, did you want to give this to me, or did you want this one? If you can copy it, oh. it would be, be better still if you can. Okay, I'll copy it. Uh, why don't you leave it in there, though? All right. And I'll just. No, I'll here's just here's a picture. I'll know for both, sure. Both uh, Albacore and yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, the. Don't be put off by these. I leave them in. But no, I don't. No, and uh, so anyway, yeah. And these were the main uh, uh, desert. We were in the mm -hmm. desert for a long time, mm -hmm. as you know. So yeah. Um, then the other. I thought you might be interested in something just for fun. Uh, I cut it out the other day and. I was going to throw a lot away, and I said, "Well, this this is fun for my grandchildren to think to see it." Uh -huh. I think you would oh, you would appreciate it more than other people. I'd like to make a copy of this too to put okay. in with your bag if you don't mind. No. Yeah, I'd like to read that too. <laughs> well, put this. <coughs> yeah, just where it was, and yeah, put this right I'll leave there. it in there. And just the stuff that I, like the copy okay. stuff I'm copying, I'll we'll use with your biography, and then these I'll just. Well, the thing I, I did mention to you, really, I mean, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, really, are we interested in what happened in the in the British? Yes, we are very much so. Uh, uh, that is, I want to. I want. That's what I want to now go fill some holes in here. I, I, I went through your thing. This is very nice, and I want to expound on a, a few things like that. Uh, the one that I was going to ask you about was that Operation Chocolate. I didn't know that's what's the name of it, but uh, where you had landed behind the enemy lines. Yeah. What we're kind of doing is, I, I've told them kind of like. Brokaw did in his book, with his greatest generation, because I think that applies not just to America, but to, to basically anyone who, who was involved in that. And part of it was growing up in the Depression, as far as here, and, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. When you grew up, was there a Depression going on in England as well? Uh, yes, uh, but that was earlier, really. Um, you know, by the time by the time the, the war started, uh, you know... In By then, I know, but I mean back in the late 20s, oh, early 30s. Oh, yes. It was... Oh, yes. Now, was your dad, was your father in with Colgate? My father then was in Colgate, and he was an American, he's... and he, he had come over, uh, you know, in 1916 to... to uh, actually, he came over in 1916 uh, to... Uh, with the franchise for a <laughs> for a product called the Oceda Mop, which uh, oh, yeah. uh, he, um, came. he he was rather lucky because he was an Olympic swimmer, as I think you know, 
and he came from Evanston, and of course they used to swim in the Great Lake, and Milwaukee was one of the places where they had a swimming club, and so he got to know and, and be known by a lot of the industrialists around that area, so he managed to get, uh, having sw swum in, in, in uh, 1908 in the Olympics, he managed to get this uh, uh, agency for uh, Western Europe and for, for this Oceda Mock from a guy called Charlie Channel who was, who was uh, an office in Chicago. And he came over in 1916 and uh, was, was quite successful in uh, launching it thanks to the help of another American uh, who came over early, Gordon Selfridge, who started the first supermarket or department store in London, and Gordon Selfridge uh, did a lot of. Not only did he did he stop the O.C. to mop and, and make it successful, but he also lent uh, lent Bob uh, some money to to make it go. It was successful, but then. Uh, seemed to be then fairly free before America came in the war, in the First War, uh, access between England and the States, so they could go backwards and forwards fairly easily, quite both, obviously. And uh, so he went back, well, one time he went back with a Rolls Royce and a chauffeur, and he sold the Rolls Royce to Douglas Fairbanks, and the chauffeur disappeared. And <laughs> <laughs> took up, took up <laughs> residence <laughs> in the States. But anyway, then, so when he went back on one of these visits to Evanston, he then uh, knew quite well uh, the, the owner and the uh, head, uh, Mr. Johnson, of the Johnson Soap Company. And they were the people that made Palmolive Soap in Milwaukee, and they were, that was a soap, first build soap. And he was very interested in that. So the next, so when he went back, he had still had O.C. the mop, and then he took over Palmolive. And that, of course, was much better in the countries that he went to, which were usually Sweden, France, Belgium, Holland, um, mainly those, England. Spain, no. Portugal, no. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and then, then when he came back again, he, he gave up um, Oceda. I mean, he, he wanted to concentrate on, on the farm And uh, just about the time he came, came in, some guy walked into Charlie Channel's office and shot him at his desk, so it was just as well that he... <laughs> and uh, so then, to, 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 ask, to, to answer your question, yes, he went on with the, with the American Palm Olive Company. They thought of him, they were then in, in Chicago. They moved into Chicago, made it Palm Olive. Uh, Johnson was still with them, and he still was one of the directors. And instead of calling it the Milwaukee soap, they called it so well, Palmolive is so successful, let's call it Palmolive. And they moved to Chicago. And then they came into the uh, into the real depression. And uh, then Bob, like a lot of them, uh, lost all his shares. He had a lot of shares, stock options, whatever they gave them in those days, but they were probably on margin and he couldn't uh, pay for them. So really from then on, funnily enough, then on he never really had much Colgate stock. I mean, basically, but he, he was, was, was not that interested, having been really badly burnt. But, um, but then he, um, then of course the, the business uh, after the war grew really substantially. And, uh, now, but when, were, when did it start being called Colgate? When did he what? When did it start calling it Colgate? Well, Colgate, well, <laughs> the story was, of course, that um, uh, 
the Palm Olive Company, they'd already had Pete, which was a Kansas City firm, and then they, around about 1929 or 30, they had a merger with Colgate. I don't know, but I would think about 1931, 32, but anyway, what happened then, of course, was that the Colgate family ended up with a majority of stock. So, they, some of the people who were my, my father's sort of uh, uh, peers, they were all either fired or, or had to leave because the Colgates then came in and um, uh, you know, took, took over the company. company. And uh, the little band of, of Palm Olivers, they had a, an ice rink in Paris called the Palais de Glace, which they thought was going to be a good investment. They had to sell that. And so that was where, that was the worst, I mean, just as bad in England, but people weren't in the, in the stock business in England in those days, you know, really. So it wasn't affected as badly as this one. But then anything, everything went on well on the Colgate Farm on it, and uh, yeah. uh, then gradually, what what happened was that uh, um, in the 30s, uh, a very fine uh, individual called E. H. Little came in and became one of the four sales managers for Colgate Palmolive in the States, and. Then, I think it was Al Craigie was his name, but anyway, he wanted to promote uh, Ed Little to be uh, sales manager over these divisions. And the th other three divisional managers went in to Al Craigie and said, if you, if you elect Little, we're all leaving. So Little was too good a individual that then uh, Bob got a letter from Al Craigie saying I'm sending you Ed Little I look after him I'm putting him in charge of, of continental Europe uh, out of Paris and uh, so that's then th this is in sort of so 1930 about 1933 to 1937 or 8 Little did a hell of a job in Europe. He bought up soap banking companies in in Germany and in Italy, and he, you know, really, he was a dynamic individual, and so dynamic that at the end of the before the about 1937, he went back and became number two in 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 the states worldwide. Then. The war came, or 39, and, and uh, even 38, Munich, and so forth. And all the U.S. managers that had put in uh, into France, into Poland, and into, into Holland, Germany, Sweden, France, and Italy, they all decided to go back to the States. And they were all given jobs in the States. And Ed Little then offered my father and said, well, you're the, England was then the biggest uh, export you know, subsidiary, said, I'd like to, you know, to come in, you come in as my executive vice president. And, uh, and Bob said, no, he said, I've been in England since 1916, I look on them as my, uh, country and I'm going to stay with them through the bombing and the rest of it and the hell of it, you know. So it was probably a mistake on his part, it was a very, very good one, but uh, I think then, uh, the, you know, the, the business was governmental business, your soap was not wrapped individually and uh, packed in gross and this and so forth. Anyway, he stayed on and uh, uh, he was loved. He was loved by his uh, staff, uh, his amazing uh, uh, affection they had for him. 
And he stayed on, and I think about 1956 he he retired. And um, and he met your mother over in England. No, she was American. She was American also. And they went. Um, she came from Greenfield, Indiana. He came from oh. Evanston. They married in Dana Hall, where she was a, a, a student in sort of her graduate years, and came right away. Uh, uh, to uh, to England, he told you know. I mean, he told her what a wonderful place it was. They went down to to Brighton. the The Olympic team. He was only what 17, 17 or eighteen. They trained in Brighton for the White City Games, and uh, a, a nice story about him. And one day. He was a he was a good uh, sort of fast swimmer, but also a good long range because he's swimming in the lakes and, and they had that kind of thing. Anyway, somebody came up to them and said, "Listen, would any of you like to uh, to pace an Australian who's going over to swim the channel? And you pace them, there'll be a boat with you, and uh, when you've had enough, they'll pick you up, but you keep him going." So. This was ideal for, 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 for Bob, so he was out there. I mean, you could see the coast of France swimming along, and somebody tapped him on the shoulder and said, you better come out now. The Australian gave up about three miles back. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he fell in love with England, uh, the, the White City games. Where the city now, White City, where is that? Just outside London. Still there. A greyhound track now, but it, it was the main uh, Olympic uh, stadium, mm -hmm. and it also was in the 1948 games. Oh, okay. And uh, but in the in they didn't have other subsidiary buildings like they made for, for swimming and the rest of the 1948. Yeah. And they had a pool, open air pool in the middle of the city. So he really loved, uh, yeah. you know. So when he came back. To, uh, to the States. Then his father uh, was a very sort of strict head of uh, a glass business, which was a family business called Foster Forbes Glass, which started in, in, uh, in Kentucky, Connecticut, then went to Chicago, and then went down to Marion, Indiana. And he was made a salesman. And <laughs> And really, he uh, he couldn't stand it. You know, his father was a very good sort of uh, Methodist preacher as well, and so and so he eventually, when when he fell in love with Josephine, my mother, you know, he says, "Well, let's get let's." He said, "England is the place. You know, <laughs> England is the place. I love it there." Let's go over, and she sort of said, "Well, you better get some business or something." So that's when he started going to his old um, yeah. friends, and and eventually got these. Um, do you have any brothers or sisters and sisters? He had, yes, he had. Oh uh, no, do you, uh, you? I mean, okay. you yourself. I you? have one sister. One yeah. sister. How? Uh, She's what's older her name? than me. She's still in England. No, she yes, yeah, she lives in England. She has a place in Florida where she she wants to, and, uh, uh, and quite truthfully, I think you'll see a rather rather awful picture. In here. Oh, in there, yeah. Anyway, he was in that glowworm. He was the the first officer, oh. and uh, of course, only sixteen out of that destroyer uh, were saved. And he was killed, and then of course she. Uh, oh, that was her husband, you mean? Her husband, and then. Oh. So she married again later on, but. Um, yeah. Uh, and he was serving under. <laughs> he, was, he was serving under an officer called Captain Roop, who was determined to get a Victoria Cross. Mm -hmm. He was determined. So, with regardless of what he might do with his crew, when the they. They fell behind the fleet, which in those days we did, to pick up a sailor who had fallen mm -hmm. overboard. They suddenly found the two German uh, battle cruisers coming towards them, and instead of getting 
uh, away, which he could have done and destroyed probably, he attacks them. <laughs> and he gets the VC dead. Yeah. <laughs> you? Oh. you know. Yeah. Anyway. Um, when you were growing up, like in the 30s, did you think much about Hitler and what was going on in Chamberlain and Churchill and all this stuff? Oh boy, well, I mean, that was a, when, it, when I was, you see, I was up at Cambridge then and we were very, very much concerned, obviously, and, uh, and uh, God, we used to listen to that radio at night and listen to the guy ranting away and it was really quite frightening. Is that that Lord Ha Ha they talk about? Or? Lord Ha Ha, but, but listening to Hitler himself. Oh, Hitler himself, yeah. And um, so then, then when, of course, Neville Chamberlain and the Munich and the agreement and... and uh, what was the feeling of the, of the British people about that agreement? I mean, did everybody think that that was a thing to do? Or, or were there or did more of them think like Churchill that uh, it wasn't? Or, or do you well, I, I think they realized that, that this was a... I think most of them realized, and Churchill really, that this was a time-saving... Yeah. In other words, in other words, to make that uh, Munich agreement, it had hoped that he wouldn't attack Poland and he wouldn't go any further. He'd taken Czechoslovakia and Austria, and they thought that, that, that this was a time. And the minute that that, then we started in England getting the factories ready to make war planes and the rest of it. And of course, Churchill. Uh, when around the country came to Cambridge and of course he was right against it. I mean he knew perfectly well that you weren't going to, going to uh, and then we, of course we had that that abortive thing of Finland where we, you know the, there was that force that went into Finland to try and cope with the Russians. Did the British send the uh, force? Yes. Oh I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. I didn't know that. I know yeah. the, you know, obviously the Finns but the yeah. Russians it did really good. Yeah, right? was it with I think some Americans in there as well. Oh, uh -huh. And they went in there to try and stop that. Well, that was a f fiasco. Mm. So, no, I think we then realized. I mean, I mean and, and uh, in my book, I say I, I happened to be, you know, on the way back from right from Maitre oh, oh, oh. and the fr the French had already. They'd been. They knew things were happening. They'd all that summer of of '39. They'd, go, they'd been called back to, to go into their regiments if they were you know, uh, reserves and the rest. And they were tearful business and the rest, that was in. And we stayed on about a month and then, then uh, we got on the boat and as you know, as I say, we hit, hit uh, opposite House of Parliament as they declared war on that to September the 3rd. And we saw the light on the Parliament and knew the thing had started. And the minute, of course, uh, I mean, I, you know, I was born in England and I was schooled in England and, and I, I really didn't have any affiliation with America. I mean, I'd been over a couple of times, but, but, um, and obviously my uh, attitude was, uh, let's get at that, the, the, the Germans and, and in, um, in, in October, um, well, right in September, a fellow called Peter Hastings and myself, uh, we volunteered and they said to, to me and to him, well, you're at Oxford, Mr. Hastings, you'd better go back to Oxford and, and, uh, and uh, volunteer there and you, David Foster, go back to Cambridge. So we went back to Cambridge and in October, um, I volunteered for the British Navy, and because Why of my oh, because what? of my brother-in-law. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. See, yeah, so of course that one. Yeah. Thinking that I didn't know the I, I didn't. Yeah. So I thought, you know. And as I was waiting, at Cambridge, through the desk, and the guy said, uh, incidentally, would you be interested in joining? the flying side of the British Navy. 
and I said, oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, wings and frights and everything. But you've <laughs> never done any flying or thought no, about it before? So I said yes. So I volunteered for the Fleet Air Arm rather than just the Navy proper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then I had to wait till April 1st to be called up because of, you know. And so April 1st, and we all thought then, the ones that had volunteered at Cambridge, now some of them going in the Army, a lot of my friends, they immediately got a commission, officers. And when we said, when we went in the Navy, we thought, well, we'll be, you know, we'll be midshipmen or something. Not a bit of it. We were just ranking. We we're going to bell bottoms and the rest of it. There's no question. They had changed that 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 law of uh, to be equality um, fairly early on in the in the time. So one thing they did give us, though, when we went to Portsmouth uh, and in the Royal Naval Barracks, which was for all ranks, they gave us a white armband, which was supposed to signify that we were rather special, we were flyers. But of course everybody, when you went in a pub, and the, and the other people who were, your, who were your same uniform, bell bottoms and the rest of it, they'd say, hey, what are you doing now? Oh, you, 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 you surrendered already, got the white <laughs> flag out? <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite fun. Anyway, yeah. but then we went through the whole of the training and went up through Scotland for torpedo training and then deck landing training and then bombing down in, uh, in uh, west of England and then uh, went to Greenwich to, to then be taught how to be an officer, having been, been uh, knocked down as a, as a normal uh, Bellwall and Sailor, and we were there, and then we went posted to various places. Yeah. You said that, uh, so what were the planes that you trained on? Then? The trains on were the little yellow, the Magisters, Miles Magister. And then when we got to the kind of bombing and, and uh, deck landing, we then used old uh, British aircraft which were Heinz and Hearts, which were either ferry or, and they were all biplanes. Mm -hmm. And um, they were very out of fashion, you know, just two, two mm -hmm. cockpits and the rest of it. But that's how we trained. And then, um, then when we got down to, uh, um, to, to doing the bombing and the rest, then we were on swordfish. Uh, uh, the ferry makes swordfish too? Ferry swordfish. And they're damn good planes. I mean, uh, reliable, but of course slow. You couldn't do more than about 130 knots. And, but uh, open cockpit. And, but, mm -hmm. uh, and then... Did you did you fly the swordfish in combat then? No, I don't think I... Uh, I might have done some anti-submarine mean patrol or something, but I think when we got to uh, uh, I was going to say I think the Albacore came in before before we left for uh, left for the Middle East. In other words. Um, Yes, because yes, the Albacross came in. Because when we joined uh, 821 Squadron mm -hmm. in the desert, they were Albacross. So they, they had come in uh, probably um, in 1940 into the Navy instead of swordfish. Yeah. Now, you, your first combat experience you mentioned was anti patrol where you, you um, went ahead of a, a convoy that was going to Malta. Yeah. Uh, it was called Operation Vigorous. Yeah. So you might have been that. Those may have been swordfish. No, they, were, they, they, they were albacore too. That's what I was wondering. Okay. Um, and uh, were you attached to a, an aircraft carrier then? No, no, no. Um, when we went round the Cape, in a very nice trip in the Georgia or Britannic, one of those ships. Very. Uh, the minute we got into uh, to into 
Port Tufik, which is south of the Suez Canal. We got in there, and we had two things happen to us. We got out of the ship to go by train up the uh, to, to our, our camp, or no, right right up to Alexandria, and then after we, we got out of the, uh, the the ship, and the ship was dive bombed that night by Stuka bombers, and completely uh, burnt out, and it had to be beached. So we were we were, we were off that. <laughs> And then when that was we like a troop, a troop ship, a transport ship. No, it was a no, it was a, 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 a White Star Cunard, White Star liner oh. that we went round the Cape in. Oh. <laughs> and um, what was the name of it again? The, uh, it was a, it was a Georgic, Georgic, Georgic. It was a White Star. All the uh -huh. all the White Star in it in IC, and oh. the Cunard were in IA. Oh, okay. And the Georgic. And then when we got on the we got on the train and we were going up more or less alongside the Suez Canal. We saw a carrier coming down the Suez Canal, which was the formidable, which we had been assigned to, and it had been bombed by the Germans uh, on the Crete landings, which had just gone on, and it was going from there around to the States to be the. Um, uh, repaired and so you were supposed to have gone on to the formidable then. You had well, orders to the uh, formidable. Yes. So we all then arrived in in uh, in uh, Decaia, which was the base outside Alexandria, and they didn't know what to do with us. So they they said, uh, right now, all of you here will look after you, but we'd like two volunteers to go down to our uh, uh, flight depot down in the, at, uh, called, uh, uh, at, uh, at Fayed, uh, which is opposite the, and to do the ferrying of planes to the squadrons, and to do uh, also test flights, you know, made it sound terrific. So myself and a guy called John Wilson standing and said, come on, let's, let, let's, let's, Let's uh, uh, volunteer. So we, we stepped forward <laughs> and we went down to the uh, to this fire which was just being built, and it was it was a it was an absolute menace. And nice nice runways, but the buildings were useless. And we ferried these planes. We flew uh, not only Albacores, but we flew some of the uh, other planes out to, to squadrons, nothing very great. And uh, then, of course, we were bombed, and um, uh, John Wilson and I were, what we would do would ferry the plane up to the squadrons, which were uh, either fighter or, or the Albacores, which were up by. Uh, Alexandra, and then we would take a train back to um, down to to Fayed, which was a good three and a half hours or more. And anyway, one night the bombing was was very bad, and the plane was very delayed. And so when we got to uh, forget the name of the town, but sort of main town there. Normally we had transport to our fire, and there was no transport. So we said, well, to hell with that. So we took our parachutes on our shoulder. We had to take them with us. And we started walking back to the base. And the base was about, I go about five miles or something like that. And on that trip back, I got bitten, I know, by, it's all desert, by mosquitoes. And um, so about, well, I suppose, Ten days after that, I suddenly was very ill, and um, I ended up with malaria. Mm -hmm. And I went into the army hospital there, which was again intense. And um, my temperature went up and it went down. And then, when my temperature went up again, the doctors got a little concerned because I shouldn't—it shouldn't have happened. And then they found 
did a little more research. It wasn't a very big uh, kind of uh, technical slide. They found that I had uh, a paratyphoid. And they then found that I got it because the fired camp water had been contaminated by being a dead, dead Egyptian in the water tank. So then, then I was in hospital for 11 weeks and very nearly didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And then I went up for two weeks um, uh, up, uh, up in uh, Palestine by, by Tel Aviv for a camp there. And when I got back, went to the, they, they said, you can't fly for at least, uh, at least six months. So they sent me up to the desert as <coughs> sort of operations officer for a fighter squadron, uh, which was which was good experience for me. And, and uh, you know, one of the operations is a question of time and get the flights off and everything like that. And so it really wasn't until uh, you know, beginning of, of 42, that I joined 821 Squadron to be a serious operation. Mm -hmm. I mean, and... and uh, so, so that's where you flew out of when you did your first rebound yeah. of Malta. I wanted to ask you about, uh, I saw the movie The Guns of Navarone. Yeah. Have you seen that? Is that, were there really guns like that? Yeah. They were, I mean, that, that was pretty much a true story, or based on a true story? As you could, yeah, but that wasn't really on the desert. Right. Not that the desert was completely flat. And, yeah. And, uh, this was an island out in, out in the island, middle, yeah. middle of. But uh, yeah, that had some mountains and it was in Crete or right. one of the others, you know. No, and then all all the uh, squadrons were out there. Um, it was eight two six eight two one. They had been on the carriers, and that they had been what was left of them after Crete were landed, and they were sometimes. Uh, because of the experience, they were uh, instructors, and uh, so those squadrons then were just uh, sent out to the desert because they didn't know what to do with them, and we were bombers, and, and uh, so we we were uh, put in into uh, under the command of uh, 201, which was the local RAF, uh, but the Navy had a call on us if there was any mining to be done or any torpedo work or anything at sea, they had the, uh, the right to call us to do that job. And uh, for instance, we, we were called in to do the mining of, of Tobruk. Uh, and we were also called uh, to do the uh, uh, attacks on some uh, uh, any ships coming in, which was one of the ones chocolate was right. under the Navy. And then, of course, what happened, we uh, went forward and then Rumble was successful, we all came back. Yeah. And then, of course, one of the most wonderful things that I did, not I, but, but uh, is that we used to do night flying and um, you used to do, sometimes have to do two, two uh, operations at night. You know, we, anyway, we went up and the, 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 the RAF had certain, certain uh, uh, ground uh, lights which were supposed to guide you to various things. Because quite truthfully, it was like being over the sea. And why they liked, why they liked the naval squadrons, because we had observers, navigators, because they could get around, whereas the RAF had to do it by sight and they were going at much greater speeds and the Wellingtons and things, they'd, they'd see a, a leaguer of tanks and say, oh, there, there's something like that. When they turned round, two miles later, they couldn't mm -hmm. find it. So uh, eventually we became the sole flare droppers over the targets for the RAF. So we became really the first pathfinders mm -hmm. and one night uh, we, they knew that one night I came in with my nice little observer uh, uh, scruffy Cooper mm -hmm. and we saw a lot of army colonels and 
majors and generals and everything in the operations officer. And so when we were briefed, this is, we were going out, I suppose, at about two o'clock in the morning or perhaps a little earlier, and we wondered why they were all there. And why they were there is that Rommel had made a dash towards Cairo, but because of bad weather, ham scene and all of that, they, they didn't know where the hell he was. And they couldn't fly to get him at that time, the Blenheims and the other things. So anyway, we went out and they gave us the, the position where they thought he was. So we went out there and we circled round, dropped a few flares and the rest of it. And then either I did or, or my observer said, well, let, let, let's, let's go farther south. So we went about another 50 miles or so south. And then, and we dropped a flare. And then, David, you've never seen anything like it. Just a row of panzer vehicles and tanks all going through middle of the night on the way to Cairo. I mean, it was the most frightening thing that you've ever seen and, and impressive. So we'd found it by mistake. So we then, what we did, we got over it and we started dropping flares and then we had a signal for the for the uh, Wellingtons. We'd, we'd, we'd fire very pistols out and they would see it knowing that it was a special target. So they came. Also the other people were succeeding us or in other at the same time they saw us and they came down to continue uh, illuminating it. So when we went back to report into the operations, of course, everybody was, God, you, you know, you found it. I didn't say that, to, but you found it. We got the exact, uh, exact navigational operation of it, where it was, what they were doing. And there's sort of a great sigh of relief that we'd found the damn things. It was just by luck that we, we had put the flares over them. Oh, and uh, it was quite, and from then on, it, it, of course, it was, uh, then when, then when uh, another very interesting one was, was uh, when Rommel started running, uh, we were continually over the top, front of him, dropping shares, shares so, so that they would be flares so that the RAF would attack. But the, the Allies were on the same reciprocal course, but in the desert, to cut them off. Mm -hmm. So what they wanted us to do was to somehow really bomb, delay them, the, the front, so that, so that the Allied tanks and everything could cut them off, which they did. I mean, you know, quite a, quite a uh, now, was it flying at night? Yeah, I mean, you didn't have any navigation stuff on your plane, did you? I mean, how how did you fly at night and find where you were going and land? Just on? entirely by a, by an observer on charts. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else. So that's why they were so useful. It's like like operating at sea. Yeah. And, um, so you operated at sea at night a lot too. Yeah, we did quite a few. Um, mm -hmm. So um, when um, okay, when when Hitler was, you, you pretty much stayed in the desert until uh, the Germans were pretty well run out of there? Well, yeah, the, Ger the Germans were, were, were fleeing and therefore we knew that um, our time there was fairly limited. I, by then, was due for home leave. I'd been out in the desert since 1941, it was then 43. I was due for home leave. and. Then the squadron was posted to Malta, and uh, I was suddenly told I was going to Malta, although I was due to go back 
to England. Uh, you know, so I, so I went up to my CEO and I said, you, you know. May I interrupt you? Yes. May I serve Dr. Thompson something to drink? Would you like something? For God's sakes, how can you be so brutal? No. Keep talking. He's got, we've got to go through the war, unfortunately. I know, but you have to have some something to Would you seek like a with. Glass of champagne? I'm gonna serve. I, I don't care. I'm gonna serve anyway. Glass Just, of champagne. Whatever, yes, I've been whatever, coming yeah, here. You've been talking, talking, talking. I know. He's been asking me questions. Exactly. No, this is perfect. This don't is be so brutal. <laughs> have a little, little. No. Uh, have a little break. Good. Okay. It's already one. One hour and ten minutes. Oh well, we got we got so, plenty of time. No, we, we're just just getting just getting yeah. started. <laughs> so anyway, I said to the CEO, "I'm not." She said, "You're a flight commander. The person that you're supposed to, is supposed to take over is ill, and therefore you've got to take the flight over." So I said, "Okay." I didn't like it, but I said, "Okay, I have to take the flight over." I said, "Can I go then?" And he thought, "Well, we'll see when we get over there." You were the marine, and I didn't have it on there. So we flew over to Malta, and uh, oh God, he's in a bad shape, it had not been, it really was in a bad shape, because a, a convoy hadn't come in for a long time, and you had, you given a little bit of bread, and you had to store it, because the rats would get it, you mm -hmm. had a tin to put it in, and luckily if you went out walking in Malta, you could get one of these Maltese might have a couple of eggs you could buy. I mean, it was really, you know, anyway. So, I said, that's fine, and where am I going, and things like that. And uh, next thing I know, I'm on the damn night uh, operations to go anti-shipping. And I say, well, this is damn unfair, isn't it? But anyway, so I go, I, I go out uh, and do the uh, operation, bombing, uh, uh, my uh, freighters going in, in towards uh, to reinforce Rommel. By then it was more or less uh, Tunisia, that area. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's fine, it was all right. And, I, and then the, the, the next night or night two, then I was, was uh, uh, suddenly called and they said, the RAF was supposed to have put mines into uh, the port in, in Tunisia, but it's such bad weather that the Blenheims can't fly. So we have been allocated to do it at night. And I said, what about it? And they said, you're, al you're allocated to do it at night. <laughs> so I've never had such a flight. So we flew over, to, I forget what the name of the, the place, and it's in the book, but in uh, Tunisia to drop a mine and then flying back and I have never known for, for the, the conditions of, I went up from the light I went up and I went down and um, anyway eventually when I got back I was I was dead beat and I you know for some reason I said to the said to the doctor a very nice medical doctor uh, picture of sitting on a wall with him. I don't know if it's in the book. And I said, you know, this is this is ridiculous. I can't go on like this. I should be in England. He went on my behalf. He went to uh, CEO and said, you know, it's time you let Foster go. So I got on a destroyer and uh, went back to Alex and uh, then flew right the way across to. Uh, to uh, Freetown and up to where all the planes to, into England. So that was a f finish of, uh, of that yeah. career. And then you got uh, uh, transferred to a, a, a Grumman Adventure School. Well, then I had another very interesting six months. They sort of put me off flying and they put me as a, as a marketing man to sell Wings for Victory. And it was, it was it really, it was, it was quite wonderful. We went around all the towns, particularly up in the north of England, the rest, and we would get on to, it was a theater, we'd go on the, the stage, and there'd be an RAF guy, and a, me as a naval guy, and, and uh, we would tell something of our experiences, and you know, put your money in, in uh, savings, and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And that went on for about, 
five or six months. And then I was appointed to uh, uh, Squadron uh, 856, which was operating on the coast of England, doing anti-shipping. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Oh, Mr. thank Pastor. you. Look at that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Very Be careful. Nice. Yes. Don't touch the camera. No. Thank you. <laughs> Mine, please. Thank you very much. Welcome. Oh, Eureka, thank you very much. Yes. Good. I'll take that as well. Okay, fine. And, uh, okay, David, to victory. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was sent down to Exeter. We had branches in Exeter, one outside Southampton, the main ones in Manston, Kent. And uh, there was a lot of anti-shipping uh, e-boats and things to bomb, and we'd go out at night. And, that was still uh, with Albacores? Albacores. And they were very good for that. And so, um, so we, I was in that for, I don't know, I think that uh, that was eventually disbanded for some reason. and then. The CO of that squadron was appointed the CO of 856, was then transferred to to New Brunswick to uh, to uh, get Grumman's Grumman mm -hmm. Avengers. And he got me, he wanted me as my as a senior observer. I went over there and we were outside Boston at Squantum and we were there and our <coughs> Our flight crews came from Canada, and our ground crews have been sent in to also learn that in somewhere in, in uh, uh, I think New Brunswick, somewhere like mm -hmm. that. And we all got together uh, to, to go on to a small carrier back to England. Um, and when I got back to England, we up in Scotland actually, it was perhaps only about two or three weeks before I was then appointed to take over the squadron. And I went down to uh, Leon Solon and took over 849 squadron. And that was, of course, Avengers. And, uh, what was your, your rank then? Well, I'd been then a squadron commander, lieutenant commander. Uh, I mean, the acting, I was mean, still technically just a lieutenant, but I had to acting lieutenant commander. And then we went, then, we really didn't do much show. Uh, they were all formed, and I was a new uh, CO. The CO, incidentally, I got a letter. CO died last week, the one, wow. I, the one I took over from, Ken Sharp. Mm -hmm. But then we would just put on a carrier, a small carrier, and send out to, uh, to Ceylon, mm -hmm. or India. We went into uh, to, uh, India. To coach in, and uh, uh, then eventually through down to Salon. And uh, was it a difficult transition from the Albacore to the? No, Avenger? no. I think the hardest thing was probably the deck landing uh, uh, training, which we had to do off Norfolk, and because uh, uh, I had these these people had never done it before, you know, and and. Uh, uh, so, and actually it was the first time I hit the carrier was then, so it shows you from 1940 oh, to yeah. 1944, <laughs> the carriers were not available. Yeah. Anyway, we got back, we went straight out, and then we went to uh, Trincomalee and formed up there. And uh, then quite a funny thing that you'd like. Then uh, the... Uh, the brass in Ceylon said, right, Foster, you, your squadron is going to be 21 officers, 21 uh, pilots, 21 navigators, etc. So you've got to get six more pilots, six more observers. Yes. He said, now, he said, I'm going to ask that they had some, some small carriers there, not the big fleet carriers. I'm going to ask them to, to give you these three each, you see? 
So I then happened to have somebody who was, had been on my course with me, a fellow called Donald John. And I got to him and I said, listen, who are the good pilots and who are the bad pilots? Who are the good pilots? So when I got the list, they'd given me all the absolute useless ones. I mean, really. <laughs> Which I suppose is typical if you're told to give three right. people to sit on the square. So I went to the brass again and I said, listen, I said, these are not people that are going to be on a, on a fleet carrier going where you so they said we quite agree. They said, now you have approval to pick who you want out of those three squadrons. <laughs> so I picked the best. I had a wonderful squadron and we went round and then we we had the two big big refineries. Uh, now yeah. the Jan okay, this was in forty four, the latter 44. part of forty four. So the Japanese had they been driven back Not from those yet. areas at all? They still pretty much controlled yeah. that area of what they had yeah. in 1941 yeah. or so. Yeah. And of course they were, I mean, oil, and that's one of them, was their, they, yeah. they, so I'm sure that they put up a big fight to try and protect yeah. those. Yeah. So was it mainly, I meant to ask you too, when you were in the desert, did you have fighter escort? Well, because you were flying at night, so you probably didn't, did you? Yeah. We, we had, we had a lot of German fighters, get night fighters against us. Oh, you yeah. did? Uh -huh. And uh, there again, you have experience. Uh, I, I know when I was first attacked at night, out of instinct, you want to go faster. And I started putting the nose down and going down, and uh, I suddenly realized that in my training, I was doing the wrong thing. So I was attacked many times after that at night. And what you do is you, you get your observer and you've got an air gun and they say, there's a JU or something coming around. It, it, and so you say, right. The minute it starts turning onto our tail, let me know. And then I would start slow turns. I would close, make us, instead of going at about a, a hundred and 30, I'd turn, go down about a hundred knots and turn and uh, they would just go warring right, right. past yeah. and, and they, they couldn't, they, so that's the way that the beauty of those planes when you discover their advantages and uh, so you, you just had to, to just wait and then say right, hard turn this way, hard turn that and uh, it uh, it was impossible for them to, uh, right. now they chased you out, I know one time they chased me out badly, I was supposed to do a sun bombing and a report and they, you know, got me right out at sea, but eventually uh, I just then glided down with no noise at all until I got to the kind of level I needed and then I got you know, the engine power and the rest of it. But um, the uh, It's like, maybe you had the experience, but it, there was a great camaraderie in, in the desert because you were all in the same position. There were no, really no officers, no men. I mean, you were just in, in khaki shorts and, and, and you ate the same food and the rest of it. If you had a, an afternoon off before the flying, you'd go to the sea naked and, and bathe. Oh, we were so distress when a, a Wren officer was sent out to there. We said, and we said, well, what can we, they said, you've got to wear something now, you've got to go. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, and then you'd move, you see, from one, as, as the, the, the uh, as the Allies advanced after being right back by Ritchie and that time, then we started advancing, you'd go to another airport. A airport. Sometimes you'd fly off one airport, and come and, and land at another one at night. It was a it was a, a question of um, and uh, what, what was your thoughts on Montgomery? Well, um, I think there was uh, I, I think that Montgomery. Uh, I mean, we didn't 
have much contact, but from the Navy, from the Army standpoint, I think that they were very lucky to get him because they had a couple of uh, uh, generals who, who had failed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the, the, the person that, that I admired most was General Alexander, who actually was the boss of Montgomery, who was stationed in Cairo, and he was a much better tactician and the rest, he was the one who brought the troops out of Burma in the early days, got the retreat. But he was very quiet, and uh, but, but uh, we had great admiration for him. Uh, but Montgomery, the troops who'd been backwards and forwards, had been, been out of, uh, almost into Benghazi, then back to Tobruk, and then out of Tobruk, and the army was, was really needed some psychological uh, uh, and he gave it to them. I mean, I really, he was a, he was a hell of a good uh, salesman in that way. And then he would not eventually, although they pushed, he would not attack until he had a superiority in arms. And uh, so he, he did, uh, he was a difficult man, but he did a hell of a good job, mainly in the desert. I don't know what he did. I mean, when he got to Europe and then that was fine, but there were other good American General Bradley and the rest. But in the desert, they needed a Montgomery, and he, he did it. Now, uh, out in the Far East, uh, you didn't fly the, the Grumman's at night much, did you? I mean, did no. you do your... Oh, you did, no, that was all during the day. No. And, and did the Japanese have fighters to yeah. contend with oh, yeah. then? Yeah. Did you have a uh, fighter escort when you, when you went? Oh, yes. You did. Oh. And were they British or American fighters that uh, were escorting you out there? No, all the, apart from, apart from one flight of, of Seafires, which was Spitfires Seafire, and one flight of uh, Corsairs, which were English, which uh, the rest were either uh, not Corsair. Corsairs were the fighters, mm -hmm. and they were on. They, they were. They, they were. What were the? What, what do we call the uh, the other uh, other fighters that were on some of the carriers? But anyway, all the all the fighters on the four carriers. They, they were usually on each carrier there were two fighter squadrons and one uh, a TBF um, mm -hmm. bomber squadron and all those those were were American planes um, except Hell, Hellcats the, maybe Hell, Hellcats yes Hellcats and, and Corsairs and um, so, and you were on the um, Victorious. Victorious, yeah. And um, the rest of it, the, as I say, there was a one one Seafire Squadron and uh, mm -hmm. and one, um, not, 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 uh, not Corsair, I don't know what to but, uh, but just, well, he just died recently, a hell of a good guy. Um, Was this a British plane you're thinking of, or yeah, an American? Yeah, yeah. Um, more of a... Um, fireflies. Fireflies? On the, oh, they were on the end of that. Oh. They were also fairy, fairy fireflies. Were they biplanes? No, they were all, all monoplane, but they were... Uh, they were two seaters, I think, rather than the, the Avengers. I mean, the Hellcats or the uh, right. uh, Corsairs. Yeah. And we they were the main. They were all all American planes. Yeah. If you've been to the museum lately, we have a uh, an Avenger that's painted with the British uh, markings on it. Yeah. Have you seen it? No. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. No. I've had to come by, and yeah. I'm wondering how authentic it is. I'm sure it probably is. Yeah. And um, so the now tell me about uh, I know you went to Buckingham Palace. To, yeah. to, was that for 
this uh, the raids that you did in, in uh, Ceylon? Uh, no, I went I went once after the the Middle East. Oh. I went went once after the Middle East. And what what was that? For? Then I got the DSC then, and um, then I didn't go till after I got back into the Admiralty when I then went a second time and got the DSO and a bar to the DSC at the same time. And that was for you? The well, the DSO was for the, for the actual Palembang oil refinery raid, and the DS, the bar to the DSC was for the operations in the Pacific. Now, so what is that like when you go to Buckingham? I mean, what are they, how do they do it, or what's the deal there? Very nicely done. Very nicely done. And, uh, if you know, your family come down and nice soft music and everything like that, and then you're put in various rooms in the palace. In other words, the DSOs or, and the army and Navy being one or higher ones before that be another room where your DSCs and DFCs and MCs and the rest so they didn't get them muddled up mm -hmm. and then when it was ready they would call you and you would start down in process and you'd come along and uh, there'd be a stage where the, the king and the queen would be and then there was a sort of a walk through and, the, and then all the audience would be. Oh, so the king and queen would actually be oh, there? Oh, oh. Oh yeah, they presented the medals and both, and uh, uh, no, and, and you know the queen, the queen, your queen mother, she really, uh, because he had his limitations with his talking and the rest of it. I mean, uh, uh, it Be, was sort of it because was sort of, of his accent or because he was the old he had his studies. Oh, he's not quite a King George. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, it's it's like anything else. If, if you if you <laughs> if you had the, the minor DSC and there was you'd go along and get home and all those things. If you had a DSO, then you then they would talk to you a little bit. And, uh, and she was the one that did most of the talking. So did she talk little. to you a little bit? Then? Oh yes, yeah. like, very nice person. What, like, do you recall what she talked what she talked to you about? Yes, I mean, you know, she would she would you know, sort of say. Uh, uh, where, where, did, where, where were you and, you know, and all this and uh, what, what was your, you know, the role you were in the Victorious. And they did have some information mm -hmm. she would read off, but, but and very pleasant. And, and uh, you know, you got your family here and, you know, so I had my mother and so forth. And so forth. Very pleasant and he was there, so he could speak to as well. But she took over the conversations more than the and, uh, I saw a picture in there of you and a couple other guys. You got like handlebar mustaches on. What, what, what was that? <laughs> oh, yes. They, 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 were, they were both characters there Jack Freighter and uh, Dick uh, uh, Bigwither, I think. They, they were characters. <laughs> I love the story you would like. I know I'm wasting no, no, time. No, no, you're not, you're not uh, right. Jack Freighter was, was a, uh, uh, he was appointed to uh, to a base in in in, uh, uh, in uh, East Africa, down in the, in the, uh, south of Nairobi, mm -hmm. and. Uh, This is sort of rather like I was at the operation in the desert. He was sort of operational manual for that airport and the rest of it. And uh, so anyway, he was sort of in the tower. And very few, it was, you know, very little used. I mean, ended up in the tower, and uh, uh, the CO who was out flying, CO, maybe, had a a line tame lion that he had in a cage, grown up from a... So this Jack Freighter was in there and getting ready for the CO to fly in, and 
He looked down and there on the just had one there on the runway was a bloody lion. <laughs> so he gets out and he goes down to the air to the runway and says, get, get, get a, you know, go, go, go. See? And so the CEO lands and everything and says, everything all right here, Jack, you know? Said, yes, but your, your lion got out and was, was on the runway when you were coming in. And he said, that's not my lion. <laughs> my lion is still in this cage. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, um, when you did those raids in uh, Ceylon, uh, did you uh, take any battle damage? Did your plane get hit and stuff? Well, we could. We had two. We had two flights against Ballenbang, mm -hmm. and uh, if they, if they. If they called a third flight out of our squadron of, of 21 aircraft, we couldn't have put out more than probably six aircraft. Mm -hmm. We lost uh, uh, we lost three shot down. We lost two or three that had to go in the sea and were so badly damaged. And the fighters, were, they lost a couple, but we... Uh, 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 coming in the second time, we, 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 the only way that we could get to the damn thing and to really hit the target was to disregard the balloon barrage because otherwise we would just be, instead of being dive bombers, we'd be, you know, so... The okay, the, the balloon barrage was, there were balloons that they had up that yeah. be, to keep you from going in a certain going position. Down. Well, what happened? When we were given by the RAF, because there had been raids on Palembang by the RAF before, long, you know, uh, one of the questions we asked was, are there any balloons? And he said, no, no balloons, you don't have to worry. There's good anti-aircraft, of course, the fighters, etc. So we had to fly about 200 miles across Sumatra to get to it. And when we were getting towards it, a dock uh, uh, the, the, the group ahead of me was was the fellow who was uh, forgetting the dock and and I had the the group of the the victorious and the implacable anyway so there were two two groups and when we were approaching there I saw that there were balloons going up. See, they had them, and the the leader obviously, for some reason, decided that what the hell was had to go go round to find out a good position. Well, as I got level with the with the big two refineries, and there's a river in between. I saw the target that we had to hit, and I was being taken past it by the leader of the, of the, the whole thing. And I said, I am going to go in and attack. So I took my squadron, because he, he was still going around to take, a, take another approach, perhaps it was a good one. So I said, no, there's my target, and if I go around anymore, and I have fighters threatening me and coming down and everything, I, I'll lose it. So I went in, and I knew that I would have to go to a certain height to deliver bombs and have the, the squadron. We practiced it. We, we knew we had to go down to 1,200 feet or something like that from wherever we were, up at seven or 8,000 because you're a dive bomber and you know how you can't think that you can drop a bomb like they can in a big, you know. So I decided to go down and so we went down through the balloon barrage. Uh, unfortunately, it cut down two, two aircraft, it cut down the CO of the Implacable, uh, Commander Maidman. He unfortunately hit the balloon barrage, but we went through and we hit the target perfectly. So, 
So when we were then going round again, and two, three days, four days later, whenever the weather, again, I knew we'd have to do the same thing. So we, we did take a beating, but we, we managed to put that refinery out for about three or four months completely. Mm -hmm. And we then lost from my squadron the second raid. They probably saved my life because the second raid, my two and my number three were shot down on the way in. And I was there, left without them. Mm. But then I went down through the barrage, and the Japanese didn't follow me through the barrage. So we lost uh, uh, in that last we we lost uh, quite a few people. And then we we knew though that we'd had. Both those planes that were shot down landed somewhere, uh, and uh, another one as well. So we had a, a crew, nine crew members, that then landed safely or were able to go through the forest. And the they rest parachuted out. You mean what? they parachuted no, out? No, no. I think oh. they had to land. Oh, they they yeah. crash land. Oh. Crash landed. Mm -hmm. And those nine were out of my squadron. Those nine people were then, they put him in Changi jail in Singapore, and then after the armistice they were taken off and they had to dig, dig their own graves and then they were executed mm -hmm. after the armistice. Mm -hmm. And we've, uh, and we've, you know, it was an awful damn thing. Did they write? Anybody ever get punished for that? Yeah, they committed Harry Carroll. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> punished, but so we made a memorial in Changi for them, and we made a memorial in the St. Bartholomew's Church, which is alongside Yeoverton, which is a naval uh, air place down there. And uh, that was, a, was an awful, awful thing. Uh, you know, they didn't take any army people out of it. They just, for some reason, took these nine flyers and uh, and uh, killed them. Then I was flying in in the, uh, the Pacific, but mainly we we joined the. The fifth fleet, but the fifth fleet really didn't want us there. I mean, it's like everything else; they didn't really want us there. But so they gave us the uh, the westerly side of it, which really was to uh, to see that no planes reinforced Okinawa by going through some of these other islands. Mm -hmm. So we had what they call the Shakashima Gonto Islands, and we would bomb them. Uh, at day, and then the night fighters would go out at night and, and strap them, and uh, so that was the main thing. And then we had a couple of fairly large raids on on Formosa, on the port there, and also on one of their facilities. But mainly that was uh, not a very, I mean, not a pleasant, but an operation of of hitting the runways and, and hitting the installations, and then going to the next island and doing the same thing. So, um, and then of course the kamikazes would be hitting us. Now there, wouldn't, there weren't many uh, Japanese fighters then in, in the Pacific against us. They were either all busy up against the Fifth Fleet. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we didn't have those, but um, uh, they were there. We had some of the you know, uh, other fighters. But uh, uh, how many uh, kamikaze raids did you? In, you told me about the one. Was there any other? We, ones? Well, we had two hit the victorious uh, within uh, uh, within two hours of each other. Mm -hmm. One hit the front, one hit the back. Yeah. Of course, they hit the formidable and put it out of action uh, because of the planes on there, yeah. and. Um, uh, I think they hit the indomitable, but but not badly. The game because there were no planes on deck, and uh, I think they hit 
couple of planes that were there, but mainly because of the the uh, the steel decks. And we really weren't very apart from the formidable, who had a whole row of planes that that were hit, uh, and uh, uh, that also caused some fire in the in the hangar and the rest of it. They that was the worst. Um, uh, damage. Now you were part like of a task force, I assume, yeah. and then so you had a lot of cruisers and oh, yeah. putting up anti-aircraft uh, yeah, yeah. fire as well yeah. as your own plane. What what does it sound like when you're going through that with all that, all the explosions and I mean the guns going off? You just kind of get used to it after a while, yeah. or is it just? Yeah. Um, you, uh, you hope the gunners would not fire at you. I mean, you know, but. Uh, no, I mean when you're on the on the ship. Oh yeah. Well, I mean how? Oh yeah. It's just kind of chaos, more or less. Going yeah, on, so. yeah, but uh, you know the kamikazes. You didn't really know what they suddenly come out of the sky. You just couldn't plan for them very, very mm -hmm. well. And uh, and the fleet was fleet was attacked usually when the planes were hitting the hitting the mainland, and the and the, the Japanese knew or hoped probably that there was no defense. And that's where we had the sea fires would, would, would be, they didn't go on the long expedition. They would be circling the fleet and would be the anti, uh, I mean the six planes that you know, got some pictures were shot down, were shot down by sea fires. And uh, they were very good, but they were so much better. Now, than now that's a, a Spitfire, but Spitfire. How, how was it a little different? No, or, really, it just no except with a hook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was all. Maybe a stronger undercarriage, but no, they was they were Spitfires, and they were better then than, than anything the Japs had. Uh, whereas the yeah, the Spitfire we have at the Air Museum has a flop five bladed prop on it, so yeah. it must have been one of the later ones. Yeah, I don't think it had five. But, but um, no, they were they were very very wonderful planes. For you know, the only trouble was it with the, the little a little less sturdy for landing if, mm -hmm. if there was any bad weather and you had to land on the deck. Now, did, did you have to worry about submarines, eh? I mean, did you have any submarine sub attacks when you were out there? Yeah. We had destroyers outside, and you'd have, you'd have continually, you'd have uh, anti-submarine patrols. Did you go through any typhoons, any bad storms? Uh, not yes. bad ones. No, we actually, no, no. We were very lucky there because. Let me check my thing and see if they're still. Yeah. yeah, good. Now, you've told me this before, uh, but I'd like for you to repeat it if you don't mind, as far as how you got the Dinah Shore tournament going, how you got Dinah involved with it, and your the golf tournament here at Mission Hill is where yeah. you live. Um, Well, I, I, I wrote it up for some author that wants that too as well, but no. well, basically I'll give you the, what happened was, I suppose when I was head of uh, household products and uh, when I came over from Europe, I had to run Europe and came over. Well, okay, I guess we should back up it. Once you got you got out in 1945 or 1946, did you separate I got from out it? Christmas 1945, uh -huh. and went into Colgate in in uh, February, I think, or January or February 46. Had you planned on doing this all along? No. Didn't want to. I didn't want to. In, in fact, I didn't want to go back to Cambridge and finish my degree. I got my economic tripos and I was doing history. I didn't want to go back after six years. It would have been uh, ridiculous. No, I wanted to get on with my life and the rest. And, and I didn't really want to work for Colgate because my father was uh, was the boss. And quite truthfully, I said, uh, you know, and I was offered a job by a, a fellow called General Critchley who had an air charter company and he wanted me to be in there in the air charter. And I thought, I've had enough flying, why do I want to go and fly? And I was offered a job by an uh, American safety racer, which was a good friend of mine, who then was taken over by Philip Morris. And uh, 
So I was sort of between those and I had some other ideas. And I think my father then was very sensible. He said, listen, he said, everybody, you can get a job anyway. Coming out, you've got a you, 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 university, you know, etc., etc. But he said, you know nothing about business at all. He said, I'll tell you what you do. You join us and we'll give you a year's training and we'll put you through every side of the business and uh, then after a year or 15 months, then if you want to go and join, you'll be completely, you'll have the experience. So I said, okay. So I first went in and I went into the factory and uh, I learned how to run a distiller's unit at night and then I went in the traffic department and went to the warehouses and then I went into into the account department and then I went into uh, everything else. Then I was a salesman on the road and the bag and everything like that. And, and, uh, and I once was, was selling selling products in Bromsgrove, which is near Birmingham, and uh, had my bag, had to have a hat in the bag and, and my hat blew off over a wall. And so I put my sample case down and got over the wall and found my hat was it was in a chicken run. Anyway, <laughs> so the minute I got off the wall, there was an, um, a British constable saying, and what young man are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I said, officer, I'm getting my hat. <laughs> but so I did that. Then I went in the advertising agency on, on uh, uh, for about four or five months. And about 15 months it took, not a year, a year was a little short. I, I really was uh, ready to go. By that time I was in love with the business. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, so I, was in, I had a, a, a very nice sales account in um, south of London, Surrey and the rest of it. And uh, I was a member of several of the golf courses and I go in and have lunch at the golf course quickly. I was going to, I wanted to get into that. When yeah. did you first start playing golf yeah. and start falling in love with golf? Did yeah. you play in, in when you were at Cambridge and yes, stuff like yeah. that, did you? Uh, I, play, I didn't get a blue for Cambridge, but the, the year, the year that the war started, I played on the Cambridge team. Uh, and we had one, we had about three or four matches, and we had one against the jockeys in Newmarket. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot they put the beer back. And um, uh, and uh, anyway, so that, that's really. So luckily, I didn't have to work in the English company because at that time, through no, uh, just by chance, the, the job of export had to be suddenly completely reviewed because we'd had no exports in the war, you know, really. And it had been a very good export business. And the, the export was under an old guy, the secretary, who'd never been to a country in his life. And so, not my father, but you know, the sort of the administrative director said, would, would you like to take this job of, of, of export sales? And I said, well, what is it? And he explained it. And I said, yes. And uh, he said, right. Uh, he said, what I, we will do is we will give you as a salary, uh, I think I had a basic salary of something like 600 pounds or something, but we'll give you a commission on what you sell, 10% of your sales. So I, I, I'd been in, you know, I'd been in Egypt and I'd known the Egyptian uh, in the war. I'd met our agent there. He said, "Oh, if I could get some, get some products, David. You know, I could do this. And, you know, you tell your father all that crap." And, and then I'd been in Malta and I'd been, you know, these. I said, "Well, God." So. And then we had the whole of the Sterling area. The only the countries couldn't buy from the States then. So countries that had taken Colgate Palmolive products 
and were in the Sterling block, they had to take them from England. So, I mean, for a boy, I went out there and I traveled around East Africa, West Africa, you know, Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Iraq, you name it. I mean, all of them, all of East Africa, right the way down. The only places I couldn't was South Africa had its own company. And uh, so, I mean, when I finished the first year, David, my commission was almost as big as my father's salary. I mean, it was ridiculous. So, they came to me, and they, you know, I knew, and they said, listen, David, you, you can't go on like this. Yeah, I didn't know. I, I said, they said, well, we'll tell, tell you what we'll do. We'll give you 10% of the net profits, not the sales, the net profits. So I said, okay. So, uh, by that time, the sales were growing, and I put in advertising, and I'd done it. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't much difference. <laughs> and uh, so then, uh, around about uh, 1949, after about three years of that, then I got a call from, from um, the States. Would I come over and be the export sales manager in Jersey City? And uh, I said yes, and, and uh, uh, they said the salary is ten thousand dollars. And uh, and that really was nothing at four at four dollars to the pound at that time. So, so a guy, Bill Needham, was an express at Merrick. He says, "You're not you're not going and taking it like that. I mean, they've written, look what they've reduced your salary to." I said. That that is the base of the business, and if I can go over there, I was not only just export sales manager from Jersey, I was also a coordinator of all the export sales in the world. So that that a, that a, that a, that a Colgate company did not export into a country that was not really theirs, and 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 to see that. So, so now I went over there. And, uh, I said, you know, it's, this is, I was a my bachelor and I did everything was fine. And then the trouble was then that the Korean War started and they froze all the wages. <laughs> but, I mean, that was, and, there, and then they wanted me back in England uh, three years later. But there I had a hell of a good time because, again, there I was then in charge of all the U.S. dollar countries and that was all of Central America. Uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, not where we had companies in the Argentine or in um, uh, uh, Venezuela. And uh, then radio was the main advertising. And when I was in, in Central America, everybody had a, a ra uh, there were so many disc jockeys and their little radio and they and I, I said to I had a very nice Spanish supervisor down there. I said, listen, this is ridiculous. I said, we've counted the 42 radio stations in, in San Jose, Costa Rica. I said, it's ridiculous. They're just sending their message in the air. Now let's find out who is listening to them. So we went out at night, knocking on doors, finding out who was listening to what. And eventually we found out the, the main station, mm -hmm. and in, in all, and then we said went to the main station. Said now, would you like a soap opera? I, I mean, in, in, and the Cuba having those wonderful soap operas then, and you know, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, when I, I think soap opera's a word, but anyway, uh, and so they said yes, that would be wonderful. Otherwise, they're just playing discs. You know? Yes, so. <clears throat> we got the scripts and everything from Cuba. I'd made friends with uh, a fellow who ran uh, a radio station in Panama, 
who eventually became Foreign Secretary of Panama. We had a company in Panama, but I was not interested in them, just getting... And he would make these, these programs for us on tape, and then we would take them up, and we, had, we would go, and we'd start in Costa Rica, and then we'd go from there to Honduras, to Salvador, to Guatemala, and Nicaragua. And it was, of course, the, the most instant success. And, uh, and excuse me? Mr. Doctor, do you want a little more champagne? Uh, no, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> and Mr. Pastor? No, I'm fine too. Okay. Thank you. So, um, and then, then uh, you know, the other company, Ecuador, Bolivia, Bolivia, I forget. Um, but, um, uh, and that, that was a very good experience. So I really covered all Sterling and all the, the, the U.S. Uh, countries then were the Belgian Congo because of the uranium that they get, and Thailand uh, had some dollars, and um, then I also went to the French territories where they were imported from France. I had a very nice uh, export manager, so I then went to Dakar and all the countries. And um, this was during the latter fifties. This was no. This would be forty. This would be forty-seven oh. through forty-nine. In other words, okay. forty-six was all training. Mm -hmm. Forty-seven to forty-nine was was really the uh, export mm -hmm. uh, in England. And then fifty, I came over here, and so from fifty to uh, about fifty-three. Uh, I was over here. Mm -hmm. Then the new manager of the English company, my father was still chairman, but he was not operating. I mean, he was you know, not uh, mm -hmm. the executive. Uh, <coughs> wanted an assistant and uh, thought with, with my experience in England I would be a good assistant. So I went in there as an assistant to him, and we, we did a terrific job, I mean, we really did. Uh, we got, you know, we got the fluoride formula in before Crest, and then Crest never came. We got uh, an improvement in our Ajax that, that Vim, the local electric had. We, we really built the English company up. And then I had married a British film star, which... Oh, yeah. And um, what was her name? My name Glynis Johns. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I've heard of her. And I married her in in uh, about fifty-two or fifty-three. Mm. Anyway, um, and they really didn't think I was serious in the business because I had this, this. She was then a very good film star in England. You know. Where did you meet her? Uh, in England, you know, when I was a bachelor before, and, yeah. and uh, then when I was in the States, she came over and uh, we got together and, you know, I think two lonely Britons, that's probably why we married. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so they didn't think I could uh, really operate properly, you know, that I had a film star wife, oh, you know, and the boss of this fellow E.H. Mm -hmm. Little, said, oh, well, no, we can't, I mean, no, 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 we don't. So they didn't give me the the top job, uh, they got a guy from Brazil, uh, an American, who had an English wife, and thought because he had an English wife, he'd be good in England, which of course was quite ridiculous. But anyway, and he came in, and he was miserable. And he all he talked about was Brazil. And I then had gone to the powers to be and said, listen, I want a country. Will you give me a country? And they suggested the Argentine. And I said, yes, I'll take the Argentine. But I happened to be in New York, and E.H. Little, he saw, you know, because of his sort of love of my father, which he did, he sort of would always say, he said, he said you, David, Argentine is no good for you. I mean, he said, they're limited in this, limited in that, and so forth. He said, no, don't, I don't want you to take so I said, all right, well, when one comes around, Mr. Little, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd really like to do it, you know. And he said, yes, I know, young man, and all this. 
eventually he retired when he was 83. You know, and, uh, uh, so then the Brazilian, Gene Abbott, after about six, seven months, he wanted back in Brazil whatever happened. So he went to Brazil and they then made me manager of the English company. And uh, so then I took the English company uh, up, well it, was, it wasn't number one, but I took it up to number one, which was pretty good because we had no detergent against Italy and France who were thriving in Mexico, which is good. And uh, so I took that up and then, luckily in 1961, they put me in charge of Europe. But I, the, 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 the Europe headquarters were in Paris, in the French company, and the French company manager wanted to get Europe instead of me. So I knew I was not going to be very welcome there, so I said to New York, I said, the English company, we, we've just got a new office building, which you've approved and everything. Uh, there's room, can I take, take the staff of Europe uh, in London? And they said, yes, very much so. So they sent over Americans, mostly Americans and Europeans, and had a full staff and around Europe. And, uh, so on, and that led, led to taking over the household products, and so on. So it was a very wonderful experience, and very good luck that, that, that you were in the right mm -hmm. place at the right time, which of course is so important, you know. I mean, if I'd gone to the Argentine, <laughs> and, and the guy still wanted to get back to Brazil, some other American probably would have been sent in there, and then I'd have been sitting in the Argentine trying to make some money there. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's you've got to have the luck. Then, talking about what your question, anyway, <coughs> we, we, we had an awful lot of, we, we, we had to rejuvenate it, and uh, we, we had a lot of new products, and we had them in test cities. And um, I would go to the test cities with the brand manager and the advertising managers, and get them out in contact with the consumer, which they weren't, they were in their desks and they, you know, hell with it. And we'd have, uh, research girls with us, you know, to go around so that we weren't just, and sort of set of questions to begin with, and we go to the housewives. In those days, of course, there were a lot of housewives in, 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 at home, there aren't so many today, but, uh, and uh, so these new products, we, we, we'd uh, uh, get into a question, and eventually we would get into other questions about what they had in the home use and we'd ask to see them. If, would you bring us your packet of fab and so forth. And what about our advertising? What do you remember about it? And so forth. And we found, I, I went to all of these, these cities. Uh, incidentally, my, when the boss, this was a fellow called George Lesh, very good account of it. When he appointed me to come over to the household products, uh, he did a very wise thing. He said, David, you're not going to get a desk or anything in that office for six months. He said, if you get a desk now, you'll never get out of that office. You'll just be... F he said, you will go out on the road, you'll go to all these places, you'll meet the salesmen, you'll meet the buyers, and you'll get to know the trade which was a great thing. And uh, so anyway, we found that that the older housewives knew, oh yes, palm olive soap, and they'd know, you know, cool girl complexion, or uh, Ajax, or Fab, or dental creams. Or the younger housewives really didn't know anything. They, they, you know, so I said, well, this is no good. If you, we've got to get something which attracts in our advertising, and we were then in, big in television. Uh, this is attracts. You were in London at this time? No, I didn't. Oh, you were in the States. States. 
New York. And uh, I said, you know, we, we've got to get something. So, uh, I sort of had a meeting. I said, said to, uh, my, to, to, to uh, my PR guy, French uh, Darling, and said, I mean, what are these young working housewives? We, we've been around. We see that a lot of them are, are watching sporting events on the weekend, tennis. And, and he says, yes, they're watching. Well, I said, well, can we get in there? And he said, well, he said, the only thing left is ladies' golf. And he says, that's not doing very well. So I said, well, get the, get the facts for me. But I said, I've got to concentrate on a shareholders meeting I've got next week. But I said, uh, get the facts for me. And about two months later, I said, well, where are those facts? He said, well, they were so bad, Mr. Foster, <laughs> I didn't want to give them to you. <laughs> and um, uh, I mean, I just want to give you a couple of figures, which I think will interest you. Uh, So we looked in 1971. So we started looking at women's golf. Now, just for your interest, you probably know this. In 1965, the total purse for 31 LPGA events was $254,000, and the highest first prize money was $3,800. Okay, well, we went through that, so then we went into 71. 